Hey guys, Bartel's Bookshelf here with uh, an update on my uh, Read What You Own challenge started by Criminali. I've been reading a lot of shorter books, as I mentioned before, to kind of help me get through the challenge, but uh, because of that I've been finding a lot of really interesting stuff, and uh, I'm just going to talk about them today, so <laughs> hope you enjoy. The first book that I am, I'm talking about today is... E Pluribus Unicorn by Theodore Sturgeon. Uh, this is a short story collection from 1953. Theodore Sturgeon, obviously, um, one of the luminaries of, of uh, speculative fiction, um, wrote tons of stories, um, wrote novels like More Than Human, which won the Hugo. Hugo um, very well-respected author, wrote... Um, uh, episodes of Star Trek, including uh, Amok Time, which was the episode where they introduced Pon Far and you know the Vulcan, uh, the Vulcan symbol, you know everything. So very well respected author. I just grabbed this off my shelf randomly because uh, I, I thought there was actually a specific story that I wanted to read in this um, that I had, didn't realize was in it till I was looking up. Uh, the table of contents. Uh, I was looking up sort of just his various uh, short story collections, and uh, this one had that story in here, and I was like, oh, I think I have a copy of that. So I grabbed it off the shelf, and I read it, and um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. It was a great collection. I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with Sturgeon. I've read like a short story here and there before this. Uh, I have a copy of uh, More Than Human, but I haven't read it yet. So this was kind of my first real experience with Sturgeon as a writer. And yeah, this was great. Um, one thing that I didn't realize is that uh, Sturgeon was actually a very um, diverse writer. Um, you would think, you know, based on his reputation, that uh, that all the stuff in here would be just kind of science fiction. And there is a lot of that. But um, there's also uh, a bunch of, there's some horror stories. There's uh, some fantasy. There's even a Western story in here. So the thing that surprised me about it was that he, he was a very uh, diverse writer. He wrote all kinds of stories. And they're all pretty good. One thing that I that I liked about Sturgeon, uh, based on these stories, is that um, he really has a sense of, like, uh, of character. Um, like, even if, if the plot that's happening in the story is just kind of generic, like, sci-fi stuff, he really gets into kind of, like, the, the minds of his characters, and, and just the dialogue feels very authentic, especially when he writes about, like, um, there's several stories in here where, where he writes about characters that are, like, sort of, uh, dock workers, or, like, scientists, or soldiers, just kind of, like, average people, and, and they feel the, the dialogue... In those examples, feels very um, authentic and very real, and just very. It, it, you get the sense that he was really like bringing something to it, and they're not just kind of cardboard cutouts. Um, but there were several stories in here that I really enjoyed. Uh, I'll just talk about a few of them. Um, the one that I grabbed this collection for that I really wanted to read was um, "The World Well Lost," which was published in Ga and, um No, it wasn't Galaxy. It was Universe, I believe, in 1953, and it's one of the very first. Um, or earliest uh, science fiction stories to deal with uh, a sympathetic portrayal of homosexuality, at least to my knowledge. And yeah, the story was great, uh, especially considering the time it was written. It's about uh, these two aliens who come to Earth, and they sort of become local celebrities because they're they're so like loving with each other. They're known as the Loverbirds, um, and uh, basically they end up on a, on a spaceship with two guy two guys uh, captaining the ship, and. Um, Things come out about the aliens and the and one of the guys um, working on the ship, um, dealing with you know sexuality and stuff like that. And um, it was just shocking to me, like how open and honest Sturgeon was in writing about this subject, writing about it sympathetically and non stereotypically. In fact, one of the things that I really liked about the story is that um, the the gay guy in this story um, is uh, is very masculine and is specifically said to be very masculine, kind of as a way of sort of combating sort of stereotypes of the time, you know, being a fruit. And and along with that, there's just some there's some interesting sci-fi concepts about like sexual dimorphism, um, the light speed uh, thing they used in order to, to travel through to different planets, which is sort of like a slingshot effect that uh, that knocks you out for a little bit. Um, so yeah, that was a really great story. Um, and there were the the other story that I really liked in this um, was uh, the Saucer of Loneliness, um, which is about this woman who uh, who's just who's very lonely, very sad, kind of walking down the street one day, and she's accosted by this little golden saucer thing that projects a message into her mind. And um, over the years, she's kind of hounded by like the government and newspapers and various people to kind of figure out what the message said, but she doesn't reveal it because you know it's like that's that's her private thing. It's it's something that she wants for herself that like nobody else can have access to. It's like a very meaningful thing to her. And over the course of the story we have we slowly learn what was said, what was contained in this message. And in that it's it just comes out to it just turns into this beautiful story about sort of loneliness and isolation, um, finding solace in another person. Uh, it was just a really beautiful story. I really liked that. 
and just along, along with those two stories, like every story in here is pretty solid. Um, there's one short, short story in here that kind of I just didn't really get um, the music, but that's like one story out of 13. All, all the stories in here are really weird and interesting, surreal and imaginative, and just in great dialogue and character work. Um, just really, really great, and I'm, I'm definitely really glad I read this, and I'm definitely going to read more Sturgeon soon. I ha As I mentioned, I have a copy of uh, More Than Human, so I want to read that at some point. But if you want to kind of... Because um, Sturgeon was kind of known more for his short stories, than he didn't write a whole lot of novels. So if you kind of want to see where that whole reputation got started, then I would recommend this highly. This is a very good um, place to start. So there you go. Uh, next I read, um, this is something uh, very different from what I've been reading lately. I've been focused a lot on science fiction and fantasy lately. But this is uh, Captain Corelli's Mandolin by Louis de Bernieres. Um, this is a British uh, World War II novel that was recommended to me from... Uh, I, I have a pen pal that I've been talking to, and this is like one of his favorite books. And um, he's been recommending it to me over and over again, and so I finally uh, sat down and read it. And I'm really glad I did, because this is a really enjoyable book. Um... So basically, as I said, this takes place during World War II um, on this Greek island of Cephalonia. And uh, there's all these uh, various characters on the island, um, but it mainly focuses on uh, Pelagia, who's the daughter of the local doctor named Dr. Giannis. Her life is kind of idyllic and, 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 and carefree until war breaks out and um, the island is occupied by the Italians. And uh, the leader of the, uh, the Italian army there is this captain named Captain uh, Antonio Corelli, who wishes to be like a, a famous musician and plays uh, the mandolin. And basically... Basically, uh, it becomes this uh, this huge, sweeping, dramatic love story uh, through the ages, through, throughout the war. And through that story, we kind of learn a lot about sort of this area of World War II, this this area of the world during World War II, this this moment in time. Again, I thought this was a great book. Uh, I'm not the hugest fan of, like, war stories, because, uh, or at least, as I mentioned before, the war stories that focus a lot on, like, sort of military tactics and that kind of thing, that doesn't interest me. What interests me are the, are the people and the and the stories within, the, within war, and this is definitely all about that. The main thing that really surprised me about this book is that, obviously, being a World War II novel, there's a lot of tragedy and a lot of hardship and a lot of... Uh, disturbing uh, events and, and things like that but there's it's also really really funny which is very surprising to me um it's it's that very like dry um sort of dark british humor that i really enjoy and it sort of uh, vacillates wildly between like uh, moments of like really hilarious like comic moments and then just like moments of just like horrid disturbing awful just pathos i, I don't want to get into any details because i don't want to spoil anything but there's lots of like death and hardship and starvation on the back of it um one of the blurbs compares um yeah a there's a quote here from a.s byatt who compares uh de Bernieres to um dickens and um based on what i've read of dickens i can definitely see the comparison with kind of the the sprawling storyline all the characters the sort of like idiosyncratic characters um really kind of delving into the the culture and sort of the daily life on this island as war kind of devastates it. Uh, and it's it's also just a very beautiful love story. I've mentioned before I'm very picky about romantic uh, storylines in books, but this is just, I thought this was really well done. It's not, it, 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 it's, it's very sweeping and dramatic, but it fits with the story and kind of what's going on with these characters. And you really get a sense of like, how the, they're attract, how and why they're attracted to each other, and sort of um, the solace that they find in each other, despite the fact that you know he's technically an oppressor. There's a lot of stuff about like music. Um, there's a lot of stuff about sort of like uh, the l little rebellions, um, finding those little moments of of like happiness in the midst of war. Those little comic moments, those little, you know what I mean? Those, those little jewels of of, uh, of sunlight in the midst of war. And one other thing I really liked about this book was that there is a, a gay, again, there's a gay character in this story who is um, sort of a, a, a subordinate of um, Captain Corelli named Carlo. And he's really, he, he was probably one of my favorite characters in the book. Um, he gets like a whole backstory where it, where, it, where it goes into how, you know, he joined the army because he had these uh, ideals about, um, you know, being a gay man in the army, working, working you know, fighting alongside a bunch of, you know, young, virile men, you know, and how that kind of fantasy sort of gets blown apart. Um, and there's a lot of stuff about his struggles of being a gay man in this world where, you know, he's very much not accepted. Um, <clears throat> and again, similar to the world well lost he's very much uh built uh, against stereotype he's a very big strong burly masculine man and he talks a lot about that in the novel about how you know I, he doesn't live up to what people say he's supposed to be as a gay man and 
he was it, it was just very well done like surprisingly so to the point where I, I thought I wondered if de Bernieres was gay himself but I, and I looked it up and he's not he was married but it was just really um it was really in depth and really complex and very beautiful as the novel goes on especially and time passes there's a lot of stuff about sort of the past reaching out and touching the present um just really beautiful stuff uh obviously like i said i can't go into details because i don't want to spoil anything but it's a, it's a nice chunky uh, historical romance very um dense very complex very sad and alternately very funny yeah i loved it it was great um and i look forward to reading more of de Bernier's uh, stuff in the future which uh, my pen pal also recommended to me um so we'll see how that goes i know there's a film adaptation with nicholas cage but i heard that's not very good so i'm probably not going to watch that but the book i definitely recommend it was great um yeah so there was that Next, uh, back on the sci-fi train, I read uh, the second Red Dwarf book. This was uh, this is, uh, Better Than Life by Grant Naylor, which was the portmanteau of Rob Grant and Doug Naylor, the creators of Red Dwarf. This was the last book that they wrote together. And this, uh, similar to the first book, this very loosely adapts kind of series three and four of the show. Um, but as I said with the first book, um, does things that the uh, the show couldn't do. So there's a lot more uh, elaborate sort of science fiction concepts. There's a lot more of like a... Uh, um, what do you call it, like of an overarching storyline. But basically the first sort of quarter of this adapts the Better Than Life episode, which is the uh, the video, the, the immersive virtual reality game that uh, they get addicted, that gets them, they get addicted to and they have to find their way out of it. And then the, the last two thirds of the novel focus on um, various plot lines from series uh, three and four, like the polymorph, um, the marooned episode, stuff like that, um, but kind of ties them all together into this one big storyline. And, and again, like the first book, it's, it's really funny it's a really easy read um it's really entertaining there's a lot of stuff that this expands on uh that you that they couldn't do in the show like it goes into the backstory of um talky toaster for example like where lister bought him and, and sort of how he was made it talks about how uh, it talks about the concept of silicon heaven which is mentioned in the show but it, it, it explains in the book that all um robots and like machinery um that has any semblance of artificial intelligence was built with these belief chips in them to basically keep them from you know rising up and going against humanity because what reason would they have to obey humans when they're stronger and smarter than us in a lot of ways so they were specifically designed with this belief in silicon heaven so that they would be be good um so it's sort of a comment on like a on religious dogma and how religion kind of controls the masses. And also, there's a lot of, like, really exciting um, set pieces in this book that they could never have done on the show. Uh, so, for example, in this book, we find out that Earth has been requisitioned many, many years ago as Garbage World, which is, you know, where uh, all the all the different, you know, humans of, this, of the solar system dump their trash on this, on this planet. And so, it's, so Earth has basically just become a giant garbage dump. And Lister ends up crash landing on it. And uh, during that, there's a literal uh, uh, acid rain uh, moment where, you know, actual acid starts raining from the sky and, 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 and melting through Starbug. And he has to uh, figure out how to escape it. And he ends up building this, like, iron suit that he uses to kind of go out into the, into the acid rain so he can get out of the, out of the rain and everything. And it's, this real, it's actually a really exciting, a really suspenseful um, set piece, which I really enjoyed. And there's a lot of moments like that that are really surprising. And just a lot of stuff that's just really crazy and imaginative. Like, for example, there's a scene where List, on Garbage World, Lister befriends... Um, these giant like eight foot tall cockroaches and then uh he's like riding on their backs like they're dragons or something you know just really crazy stuff like that so again similar to the first book if you're a big fan of the show and you just want more and you want stuff that's maybe a little bit more in depth and a little bit more uh has a little bit more of an emphasis on sort of the science fictional concepts uh, of the show that they couldn't really get into um this is right up your alley um it was a, a lot of fun i really look forward to reading the last two books in the series so yeah Great book, Better Than Life. Next, I read uh, Red as Blood or Tales from the Sisters Grimmer by Tanith Lee. Um, Tanith Lee, as I've met, I think I've mentioned her before, she was a very prominent British uh, dark fantasy sci-fi author. Uh, this was a collection of short stories that are uh, retellings of uh, fairy tales, um, similar in, vein, in, in, in a kind of similar vein to uh, Angela Carter. I didn't find her, her writing in this anyway as uh, as self-assured and as poetic as angela carter but this was still really interesting um there's lots of stuff in here lots of interesting stories in here like the title story which focuses on um a version of snow white where uh the queen is actually the protagonist um she's actually the 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 good guy um 
fighting against Snow White, who's this sort of vamp- creepy, like, vampiric entity, um, who's, who's basically, like, systematically trying to, like, take down the kingdom. There's a, a version of uh, Cinderella called When the Clock Strikes that deals with, like, a, a version of Cinderella who's sort of this, like, a uh, Satan worshiper, you know, practicing, like, black magic, and it's, like, really creepy and dark. Um, a lot of the stories in this are kind of built in that vein, sort of dark fantasy, sort of horror-ish um, interpretations. One of the other ones I really liked was uh, Wolfland, which is uh, what's depicted on the cover here. Um, it's a depiction of Red Riding Hood, where uh, the grandmother is the werewolf. And um, similar to Angela Carter's werewolf stories, it finds a lot of sort of power and agency in uh, in being a werewolf, which I really liked. And uh, I also really liked the final story, which is called Beauty, which is a sci-fi retelling of Beauty and the Beast, which deals with um, beauty... Um, being uh, sort of uh, requisitioned by this mysterious beastly alien, um, and she slowly falls in love with him. Um, some of the stories in here were kind of just more straightforward retellings, like uh, Thorns, which is a version of Briar Rose, or Sleeping Beauty, which is um, very kind of straightforward in its retelling. Um, but all the stories in here were, were interesting, and the writing is very... Um, flowery and poetic which is something that i really like so if you're into this kind of thing i would definitely recommend it um i didn't i would i will say i didn't i didn't love it like I, I feel like it didn't necessarily leave me with a lot but um just kind of as a mood piece i really liked it and as someone who really likes um fairy tales and folklore and stuff i really i enjoyed that aspect of it i definitely want to read more tanith lee i have a bunch of her books including the uh the tales from the flat earth series and a bunch of like random novels here and there so i definitely will uh read more of her at some point but i think this was an interesting uh and fun place to start so yeah that was red as blood um the final book that i've read so far is uh adam link robot by indo bender um indo bender was the pseudonym of um what was it earl and otto bender Otto Bender, uh, of course, was a famous uh, comics writer. He wrote for um, Captain Marvel, and he wrote for Superman for like 20 years. And by the time he was writing, the, he was writing these stories, um, he was pretty much it, he was the sole writer, and Earl was a uh, kind of his uh, his literary uh, executor or his literary agent. Um, but the, this is uh, basically a fix-up novel that was published in 1965 of uh, all of the uh, Adam Link stories. Which were um, at one time they were published in a, um, Amazing Science Fiction, Amazing Science Fiction, and at one point they were very popular. Um, the 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 first story in here, I Robot, um, was actually a direct influence on in Isaac Asimov, and Asimov has a uh, a little blurb there. Um, so he was kind of one of the first like sort of sympathetic robots in science fiction, and um, was a direct influence on Isaac Asimov, whose novel or whose whose own fix up novel, I Robot, was named after this uh, original story. Um, apparently by the publisher, um, Isaac Asimov didn't want to name it that, but, um, yeah, so, so this was kind of the first in a long line of sort of sympathetic robot characters. And in that sense, it's really interesting. Um, it definitely betrays its pulp roots, but basically it's about this robot, Adam Link, who's built by a, a scientist, Dr. Charles Link. And the stories are kind of just, uh his adventures as he tries to kind of make his way in the world and to uh, eventually be accepted as a, a citizen, uh, as a citizen of the United States and just and kind of to, to achieve personhood, similar to lots of other robot stories that we've seen since. Um, but this is kind of one of the first to really do, to really focus on that. And that was one of the things that I found most interesting about it was that it, it kind of all started here. And uh, especially uh, the first half of the book was the most interesting for me because that's where it, it kind of gets the mo- most philosophical. Um, the, the As I mentioned, the first story, I, Robot, was great. It's about kind of Adam Link's sort of upbringing. And then um, Charles Link, his creator, is killed in an accident. And... Um, he eventually is uh, is uh, put on trial for his murder and essentially, again, has to kind of prove his personhood. And throughout the entire uh, story, um, Adam Link is, is very conscientious about not using violence against humanity, about being selfless and good and being being an example that, that can show to people that, you know, that robots do can, can belong in society and can be beneficial to humans. And also in the first half, there's also a lot of interesting stuff where, uh, so he... Uh, he gets a, a secretary named uh, Kay who ends up kind of falling in love with him, but he kind of pushes her away because, you know, he's a robot. He can't love a human. So there's a lot of that stuff, sort of can, can a human love a robot? Can a robot, is a robot capable of love? There's also some sort of interesting stuff where kind of risque stuff for the time a little bit. Like, for example, they establish pretty early on that um, Adam Link uh, isn't capable of sex, um, though he knows about it. They don't say that, they don't come out and say, you know, he can't have sex, but it's very heavily implied. And, 
um, they talk even they, they even talk a little bit about gender identity a little bit, uh, like when um, Adam Link is talking about. Um, when he sees Kay for the first time and he shakes her hand and it kind of, it's, it's his first realization of like how he is male in, in his brain. You know, he was raised male. He, he identifies as male, even though he's just a mechanical robot. Um, and so, the, and, and then he ends up, uh, that eventually leads into him making uh, his own robot wife named what else? Eve. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going into how she's like specifically raised with like a feminine sort of viewpoint, um, where Kay helps out by kind of like transferring her her thoughts into her and kind of giving her a female upbringing. So there's for the time there's some kind of interesting uh, gender identity like gender politics stuff. Um, so as I said, like the first half of the book was the most interesting to me for having all of those sort of uh, heady philosophical themes. Um, but as I said, um, Otto Binder was indeed a, a comics and pulp writer, and that's kind of betrayed in the last half of the book, where um, it sort of goes from all these like heady sci-fi concepts into just straight up like two-fisted pulp action, where uh, Adam Link ends up becoming a detective and taking down this ring of uh, mobsters and corrupt politicians, and then that leads into uh, the end of the book, where uh, these big burly horned alien creatures invade and he and Eve have to work together to take them down and that like devolves into like this scene where like you know in the beginning of the book we had all these like heady philosophical concepts about you know the nature of man and and what does it mean to be, to love and all this and then in the last uh, third of the book there's like a scene where they're in this the, the alien base and they've got these like alien guns and they're like standing side by side and firing uh, on all the aliens like a fucking husband and wife Rambo or something you know and it's just really funny it's very different from the first half of the book but it's still entertaining and just in a different kind of way there is definitely that kind of that sense of like two fisted pulpness where there was that there's that um, vibe of just kind of like throwing everything at the wall and seeing no matter what sticks you know um that i really enjoyed like no idea is too crazy nothing is too weird um there's even like a, a storyline with like a mad scientist who like uh uses this like telepathy machine to like control to mind control eve and her and uh adam have this big like superhero fight on the side of a cliff you know like just crazy like comic booky action scenes like that that are very different from what came before but are still entertaining in their own way so yeah it's it's obviously not <laughs> literature it's not like a fantastic piece of literature by any means but um as a piece of sort of sci-fi pulp history it's really interesting, and it's very short. It's a very fun, uh, lighthearted read, um, and very influential, obviously. So it's very interesting to see from that perspective. So I was, I was really glad I read this, and I definitely want to check out more of uh, Indo Binder's uh, stuff. I know there's another fix-up novel called uh, Anton York Immortal um, that I want to uh, try out at some point. So, yeah. Very interesting bit of a sort of sci-fi archaeology here, sci-fi history. And if you like that sort of stuff, there you go. Especially if you like robots. I mean, it kind of all started here, really. You know, the the, the sympathetic robot, as I said. But yeah, so that was um, that's all that I've read so far for the uh, Read What You Own Challenge. About halfway through. So yeah, I'm doing great. Uh, reading a lot of really interesting books. And uh, I hope you guys are too. Uh, have you read any of these books? Any of these authors? What did you think? Recommend stuff to me. Um, you know, let's talk about books. I fucking love books. That's why I'm here. Books. Books. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, until then, uh, I will see you guys next time. All right. Bye.